Thunder on the Right by Alan Crawford Read by Fax Fivem Chapter 13, Rampageous Democracy Opening with the following quote The instincts of the people are, in general, sound. There is no question but that the leading sectors of our society have lost touch with those instincts. But the task of conservatives is, while remaining in consonance with those instincts, to find ways whereby those sound instincts may be expressed without destroying the fabric of society and disrupting the complex arrangements within it that have made society possible. By Frank Meyer A near constant theme of conservative thought, from Edmund Burke to William Buckley, has been that unrestrained expressions of popular will mitigate against the orderly process of government on which stable societies depend. Conservatives have, consequently, taken a dim view of the methods of direct democracy, seeking instead to channel majority will through a complex arrangement of institutions that moderate the voice of the people. Unmoved by arguments proceeding from egalitarian premises, conservatives have stressed the need to take into account competing interests as well as numbers. To ensure that minorities are protected from the onslaught of majorities and civilized society from outbursts of momentary public angers and enthusiasms. William Buckley, as late as November 78, wrote that Conservative political philosophy abhors plebiscitarian government. The new right, impatient for short run results, has rejected this dominant theme of conservatism in favor of direct democracy threatening to shatter the safeguards against political centralization and, therefore, freedom itself. In their belief that more and more issues should be decided by the people through the ballot box rather than by their elected representatives or by intentionally unrepresentative institutions such as the courts, the new rightists reflect what James Burnham in Congress and the American Tradition, 1959, called democratism, an obsessive sentiment or ideology that is not to be confused with democracy. Democracy, he wrote, is that structure of government in which ultimate rule and authority rests in the community in general with the people expressing themselves in the tradition of this country through an elaborate process of voting, election campaigns, popular assemblies, and the like. Democracy was self-consciously a movement of the people which asserted itself in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries against the claims of the aristocracy and monarchy. Wilmore Kendall noted, We must learn, we conservatives, that the issue is not whether the American system is or is not democratic, but which of the two competing definitions of democracy, that which equates it with government by the deliberative sense of the people acting through their elected representatives, and that which equates it with direct majority rule and equality should prevail. The new right, with its enthusiasm for methods of referendum and initiative, the inventions of the populists and progressives. Facts 5 from here, I just want to give a little bit of context to this statement. Uh, nowadays, in the U.S., we are kind of used to a lot of things being directly elected. But for a long time in American history, this was not the case. In fact, for example, for I think technically still most of American history, yeah, actually for most of American history, our senators were not directly elected by rep, or, sorry, by uh, residents of the states, but rather were appointed by state legislatures. I think it was the um, which amendment was it that changed that? Um, I think it was the 17th Amendment or so. Like it was around the same time as Prohibition and the Women's Voting Right Amendments passed, and also around the same time as the uh, what's the word? Income Tax Amendment. So one of those mid-teen amendments. Likewise, it was the Progressive Era, which around like say 1890 up until World War One, so like 1890 to 1917 or sorry by World War One I, I mean America getting involved in World War One. Um, so around uh, that time there were a lot more pushes to make 
many states more directly democratic. I'm actually from New Jersey, which is one of the few states that does not have directly elected judges. I'm currently living in Maryland. From what I recall, Maryland's a bit unusual where most judges are appointed by the governor, but then, or if not the governor, then some other authority. However, every X amount of years you can choose to vote them back in or vote them out. There are other states where judges are just all directly elected. Perhaps uh, one of the most famous examples, and I'm going to try to pull this from memory, uh, in the state of California, it's a f essentially possible to directly amend their state constitution with a simple majority vote after you get enough signatures on a ballot. I actually have one friend who lives in California, and he once compared his, uh, his ballot to an entire book, just to an entire booklet. Although he told me he actually liked it because he really liked being able to think about legislation and amendments and that sort of stuff. But at the same time, in the grand scheme of things, it is pretty recent. Has thrown its lot with Burnham's democratism, rejecting the counsel of the founding fathers who, as Kendall put it, feared and disliked the politics of sheer naked will. Democratism was at work in the most widely publicized political development of 1978, when Californians went to the polls on June 6th to approve Proposition 13, a tax-cutting measure put on the ballot because 1.2 million signed a petition to put it there. The people had sent a message, a message received not only in the California state legislature, but in Congress and the White House as well. Direct action had been taken by voters who believed that their legislators had not coped satisfactorily with rapidly increasing property taxes. On the same day, voters in Ohio ruled on funding for public schools in 139 jurisdictions, defeating 86 requests for funding and overriding the recommendations of educational specialists. That same season, residents of Birmingham, Michigan, voted to oust six of seven city commissioners who, after supporting a controversial housing plan containing an affirmative action program for residents, refused to put the program to a referendum. The voters demanded a recall election and ousted from the commission all members who supported the plan. Two months before, four of five commissioners in Almogordo, New Mexico, were defeated in special recall elections, and in Cleveland, Mayor Dennis Kuchnik barely survived a similar challenge. Citizens' initiatives of the late 70s received widest and wildest play on the issue of homosexual rights. In California, John V. Briggs, a state senator who served as a foot soldier in Anita Bryant's anti-gay rights offensive in Florida, he told me that homosexuals are women trapped in men's bodies, took up the cause of Proposition 6, a referendum that would have barred homosexuals from teaching in the public schools. Ronald Reagan, asked to endorse the measure, refused on traditional conservative civil libertarian grounds. The measure, Reagan said, is not needed to protect our children. We have that legal protection now. It has the potential of real mischief. What if an overwrought youngster, disappointed by bad grades, imagined it was the teacher's fault and struck out by accusing the teacher of advocating homosexuality. Innocent lives could be ruined. Proposition 6 lost by more than 2 million votes, 3.9 million to 2.8 million, but did much to advance Briggs' own ambitions. A footnote reads the following. The week I interviewed Briggs in Orange County, California, a published report from Governor Jerry Brown's office showed that between 67 and 73, Briggs received $77,577 in insurance business from a California physician after Briggs assisted him in obtaining a state Medi-Cal contract. The report, which did not accuse Briggs of criminal wrongdoing, noted that even if any violation of state law occurred, the statute of limitations on that legality would protect him. 
Another ballot measure he supported, a bill to extend application of the death penalty, swept to a 72% victory in a 1978 referendum generated through a sophisticated new right direct mail campaign. All told, there were six anti-gay rights referenda in 1977 and 78, the cause of civil rights for homosexuals losing in all but one, Proposition 6 being the exception. A new gay rights ordinance was put before the voters of Dade County, Florida in June of 77, and voters again rejected it, this time by a vote of 2 to 1. In April of 78, voters in St. Paul, Minnesota, also by a vote of 2 to 1, repealed, by initiative, a gay rights ordinance. In May, voters in Wichita, Kansas, repealed by a 5 to 1 margin an existing gay rights ordinance, and later that month, voters in Eugene, Oregon, repealed by referendum another existing ordinance, this time by a 2 to 1 margin. By November elections that year, voters in dozens of other states also took the opportunity to decide directly matters of public policy ordinarily left to their elected officials and state legislatures. All of this frenzied activity is parallel to growing support on the national level for direct participation by voters in decision-making of all kinds. When Jimmy Carter, as a presidential candidate, promised to bring the people into the making of foreign policy, he was reflecting a trend not of his making. Every time we've made a serious mistake in foreign policy, he said, it's been because the American people have been excluded from the process. Liberal Democrat James Aburzek of South Dakota in 1978 introduced into the Senate a resolution that proposed a constitutional amendment to enable the American people to introduce national legislation on their own initiative. And Senator Birch Bay of Indiana, believing the climate to be right, brought his plan to abolish the Electoral College to a vote in the Senate. Various efforts to amend the U.S. Constitution to further quite specific policy goals are gaining steam, and an increasing and alarming number of elected officials are relying on the results of public opinion polls as guides to their political behavior. These developments point unquestionably to the transition from democracy to democratism, described 20 years ago by Burnham. The new rightists have become fellow travelers, indeed celebrants of this transition. The story of Senator Aborzek's introduction of Senate Resolution 67 is relevant here. The idea itself, though certainly not new, emerged most recently from the rundown Capitol Hill office of the group called Initiative America, a vaguely populist organization dedicated to direct voter participation in policy decisions. Its two organizers, populists John Forrester and Roger Telechow, eventually got through to an aide to Aburzek, who in turn recommended the idea to his boss. Within a month, Forrester and Telechow got to see the senator himself, I didn't need any convincing on the issue. I got my start in politics with an initiative campaign in South Dakota. Aburzek later told the Washington Post. Would his plan advance the goals of the American right? He thought it a consequence of the fact that... The liberals have run out of ideas. All the arguments against the amendment boil down to one thing, that you can't trust the people. Within months, Initiative America had rounded up the endorsements of 45 congressional candidates and boasted in its flyers that a Gallup poll showed voters favoring the idea by a margin of better than two to one. Initiative America wants congressional hearings on a constitutional amendment. The process by which proposals would be put before the voters would begin with a petition drive, so their proposal goes. Within eight months, organizers would be required to amass signatures of registered voters equal to 3% of the turnout in the last presidential election, about 2.5 million signatures. The proposal will then be placed on the ballot in the next general election, and a majority of voters would be sufficient to pass it. More interesting still is the support given the notion by three of the New Right's biggest polemical guns columnists Kevin Phillips, Pat Buchanan, and William Rusher. Phillips calling it the ultimate poll said in his syndicated newspaper column 
that the national initiative will find its maximum impact in coming years as a tool of public opposition to the culture, morality, welfare, and educational approaches and sociology of the liberal establishment. Besides tax restraints, referenda on busing, pornography, ERA, abortion, and gay rights come to mind. Phillips expressed pleasure too that the idea of the national initiative derives from the great turn-of-the-century populist leader Hiram Johnson, who used it as an end run around the local two-party systems that were under interest group control and thus ignored public opinion. Buchanan saw the mechanism as a means of avoiding the laborious processes of representative government. For years now, my right-wing brethren have been talking about a natural conservative majority out there whose will is frustrated by an elitist establishment ensconced in the bureaucracy, the judiciary, the Congress, and the media. An establishment with a game plan all its own for America, over which we exercise little control. Well, the Aborzek Amendment offers the people an unimpeded end run around that liberal establishment. Now is the time for the brothers to put up or shut up. The nation is drifting rightward, he said, and rightists stand only to gain from putting before the voters such volatile issues as those mentioned by Phillips. Rusher, in his column, acknowledged that plebiscites notoriously have their dangers, but so do Congresses heavily influenced by special interests. The plan enables a determined popular majority to bypass cumbersome institutions like Congress, the bureaucracy, and the courts set up by the Founding Fathers to resist the unrestrained popular will. The constitutions of no fewer than 23 states and the District of Columbia already authorize an initiative process. South Dakota became the first state to adopt the plan in 1898. Roughly 1,200 issues over a period of the last 80 years have been voted in state initiative elections. Proponents believe it increases the public's interest in elections and therefore leads to greater voter turnout, a cherished goal of democratist ideologues. The Anti-Institutional Impulse Believing in original sin as a political or social concept, reflecting the natural state of man, the traditional Western conservative like Edmund Burke and John Adams views government as a precarious restraint on the extreme tendencies to which men, unchecked, are inexorably drawn. Tyranny on the one hand, anarchy on the other. Conservatism involves prudence, moderation, restraint, and almost awesome respect for the long-range consequences of the governmental decisions, a healthy suspicion of those who seek short-term gains by actions the consequences of which cannot always be foreseen. There are great virtues in a conservative attitude towards structural features of government. Alexander Bickle wrote in The New Age of Political Reform, The sudden abandonment of institutions is an act that reverberates in ways no one can predict and many come to regret. Stressing deferred instead of instant gratification of social desires, Traditional conservatism is a bulwark against the voracious appetites of, in Gertrude Himmelfarb's phrase, presumptuous mass man, in an increasingly atomized and rootless world. Yet, in much of the ideology as well as behavior undertaken in the name of conservatism today, there appears an alarming impatience with the complex and cumbersome process of government. An anti-institutionalism that often manifests itself in a frivolous disregard for established channels, a desire, as Buchanan and Phillips put it, to end-run the bureaucracy, the courts, and even the Congress and state legislatures. As such, the politics of the new right may be more aptly described as radical or reactionary, populism seeking to incite a revolt, or many small revolts, of the people against the institutions of representative government. The new right is impatient with the Supreme Court and the judiciary in general, yet not long ago the right wing was one of the staunchest defenders of the court. In the 1930s, when the judiciary served to block elements of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal reforms, conservatives were the staunchest champions of judicial review. Within 25 years, this had changed. The court by this time, B. 
began consistently to come down on the side of American blacks in the civil rights movement, fulfilling its constitutional function to protect the rights of unpopular minorities. L. Brent Bozell, the brother-in-law of William F. Buckley Jr., in The Warren Revolution, raised the cry of judicial despotism. John Birch Society road signs implored, Impeach Earl Warren. For anyone not aware, Earl Warren was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court for some time in the 50s and 60s. He was appointed, I believe, by Dwight Eisenhower. Yeah, it was Dwight Eisenhower. Um, the Warren Court was one of the, if not the most liberal Supreme Courts in American history, among other cases giving us things like uh, Miranda rights and, most famously, Brown versus the Board of Education. You can see with Brown v. Board why so many far-right lunatics disliked the man. Granted, the Warren Court did also give us qualified immunity, so... Well, nothing's perfect. The right grew even more apprehensive throughout the mid and late 60s when a series of high court decisions on the constitutionality of criminal procedures as, for example, the Miranda decision, appeared to them to contribute to general lawlessness. Judicial stands on busing to achieve so-called racial balance in the public schools further distressed them. The courts, many believed, had become infected with ideological liberalism. This conclusion gained credibility outside of strictly rightist circles, bolstered in 1977 by Harvard professor Raoul Berger's book, Government by Judiciary. Berger, who came to public notice with his withering criticism of the notion of so-called executive privilege during the Watergate scandals, argued here that many matters ruled on by the Supreme Court in recent years had not been properly within federal jurisdiction at all. The new right does not appear to object to an interventionist judiciary on principle, as classical conservatives like Bickle tended to do. New rightist publicists and politicos have rather sounded the war cry of judicial tyranny whenever the courts rule contrary to their preferences. Judicial, legislative, and executive decisions affecting, for example, the integration of schools, the definition of obesity, and related free speech issues, capital punishment, school prayer, and affirmative action, or sometimes called reverse discrimination, have been reflexively denounced as usurpations of authority. The new right eagerly awaited the Supreme Court decisions on the De Funi, the Baki, and the Weber cases of the late 70s in the hopes that they would strike down any programs of reverse discrimination. Hello, Fax5, I'm here. Let me just uh, look up these three cases real fast. All right, so United Steelworkers versus Weber, uh, 1979. Um, what, let's see. Uh, Okay, the holding, United Steelworkers of America did not violate the Civil Rights Act of 1964 as their affirmative action plan attempted to help minority workers and did not prevent other employees from advancing. Um, all right. Um, so, yeah. So it held that Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which prohibits racial discrimination by private employers, does not condemn all private, voluntary, race-conscious affirmative action plans. Um, okay. Then Regents of the University of California versus Bach. Bakke? I don't know. Um, let's see. Holding, Bakke was ordered admitted to UC Davis Medical School and the school's practice of reserving 16 seats for minority students was struck down. Judgment of the Supreme Court of California reversed insofar as it forbade the university from taking race into account in admissions. Um, all right. And Difuni versus Odegaard. Um, 
holding the court held that the case was moot. Oh yeah, I remember this one. So now, yeah, this was one that, um, what was it? Yeah, American student Marco DeFuni, who had been denied admission to the University of Washington School of Law in the state of Washington, was later provisionally admitted during the pendency of the case. He was slated to graduate within a few months of the case being rendered. And, uh, well, since he was, since he was, I guess, suing over alleged affirmative action based discrimination, but then he was allowed in while the case was pending. And well, by the time the case was decided, he was going to graduate in a few months. So the court was like, yeah, like, don't bother. He's about to graduate anyway. Hopefully this helps. When the court took the eminently conservative route and ruled only on the individual complaints of Bakke and Weber, rightists were angry. The new right is similarly ambiguous about the United States Constitution. It talks about getting back to the Constitution and claims to be its true conservators after decades of abuse. Still, the new right is constantly seeking to alter it. Amendments are necessary, they contend, to counteract the abuses of the Supreme Court and to accomplish specific policy goals rather than rule on fundamental law. A constitutional amendment to allow the people to put issues as well as political candidates on the ballot is only the beginning. Within weeks of the opening session of the 92nd Congress, a bill calling for constitutional amendments to mandate a balanced federal budget achieved the support of more than 100 congressmen, most of them Republicans. The ideologically mysterious Governor Jerry Brown of California, sensing popular support for the idea, took up the cause, making it a central theme of his bid for the Democratic presidential nomination in 1980. But too late to win right-wing support. Conservative Digest had denounced Brown in 1975 as a dangerous liberal. Other amendments that sought to limit federal spending enjoyed the support of conservatives, including economist Milton Friedman. Observing all the excitement, classic conservative George F. Will calmly warned against the dubious business of constitutionalizing economic policy. Support has been growing, too, for amendments to prohibit abortion, one of them drawn up and introduced by Senator Jesse Helms of North Carolina, forbidding the operations even when the life of the mother would be endangered. Amendments to prohibit busing and to permit supervised prayer in the public schools were specifically designed to undo previous Supreme Court decisions and to affect policy objectives their supporters could not yet achieve through ordinary legislative channels. Yet the new right criticizes proponents of the Equal Rights Amendment on the grounds that they demonstrate a similar disdain for realizing their policy goals through the democratic process. New right publicists who, in recent years, have rediscovered the social conservatism of the lower middle classes in America profess a principled democratism. They maintain that conservatism has always contained a healthy respect for the good sense of the common people. Some cite Edmund Burke's description of the English people in Reflections on the Revolution in France as Thousands of great cattle who chew the cud and are silent, sanely resisting the half a dozen grasshoppers under a fern that make the field ring with their inopportune chink. Forgetting, of course, that today the new rightists themselves seem, on the domestic front, to be making most of the noise. The new right has come to embrace the conviction of the Wallace constituency that the process of representative government have become sinister mechanisms to thwart the popular will. To appreciate the changes that conservatism in America has undergone as it moved to the right, one need only recall that the John Birch Society continually lectured in the 1960s for all who would listen that the United States is a republic, not a democracy. A small number of conservative intellectuals also has come to develop a kind of democratic faith, but a faith that falls far short of populism, best represented by Wilmore Kendall. Even his democratic faith remains suspect to conservatives since it had its origins in the brilliant, if erratic, philosophy's youthful days as a leftist. Kendall believed the American people carry the great conservative tradition in their hips, a phrase he attributed to Lincoln Steffens, and in 1938, 
advocated the Ludlow Amendment to the Constitution under which Congress would be prohibited from going to war, except in case of invasion, without support in a national referendum. He said, There are those of us who believe that the best judges of a nation's welfare are the people who live in it, and once that belief has been set aside, the door is thrown wide open to the most violent excesses of minority rule. A rugged individualist from the American West, Kendall called himself an Appellations to the Rockies Patriot. He had the familiar resentment of the East and all that is associated with it. He called it the World of the Buckleys. Carl Hess, in 1964, a speechwriter for Senator Barry Goldwater's presidential campaign, began to outrage conservatives in the late 60s by taking seriously the near anarchism preached by those on the right who consider government per se diabolical. He began to flirt with the libertarian left. Widely dismissed as a crank, Hess stopped paying income taxes and moved to the hills of West Virginia where, in the spirit of true American individualist tradition, he began to earn his living by welding and writing. In a 1979 article celebrating the so-called New Populism, Hess praised the Aburzak Amendment and assailed the elitist assumptions of David Rockefeller, the big business community, and the Trilateral Commission, even taking pot shots at George Will. In Kendall's day, such heresies were regularly and effectively hooted down by the dominant traditionalists of the Russell Kirk School, who retained enough sentimental attachment to a more aristocratic European conservatism to find such democratic sympathies a bit too folksy for comfort. Even Barry Goldwater, in the conscience of a conservative, argued that the Constitution was designed not to establish a democracy but to frustrate a tyranny of the masses. Majoritarians and anti-majoritarians did agree on this, that the United States was never intended to be and should not be allowed to become a plebiscitary system. Kendall's so-called majoritarianism, after all, derived from John C. Calhoun's notion of concurrent or constitutional majority. Calhoun, a southern aristocrat, held that consensus took into consideration interests as well as numbers recognizing that any community was made up of different and conflicting interests that must be weighed if the sense of the entire community is to be determined. This determination is reached, moreover, through compromise. A footnote here reads the following. Calhoun wrote of the two modes of taking sense of a community. But one regards numbers only and considers the whole community as a unit, having but one common interest throughout, and collects the sense of the greater number of the whole as that of the community. The other, on the contrary, regards interests as well as numbers, considering the community as made up of different and conflicting interests as far as the action of the government is concerned, and takes the sense of each through its majority or appropriate organ and the united sense of all as the sense of the entire community. The former of these I shall call the numerical or absolute majority, and the latter the concurrent or constitutional majority. I call it the constitutional majority because it is an essential element in every constitutional government, be its form what it may. You know, this is the first time I've actually seen somebody speak positively about John C. Calhoun, of all people. For anyone unaware, John C. Calhoun was the vice president under Andrew Jackson. Let me, let me just double check. Uh, yeah, under Andrew Jackson. Oh, Andrew Jackson and John Quincy Adams. I uh, did not expect him to be under both of them at once. Well, okay, rather one than the other. He's also the man who infamously declared that slavery was not a necessary evil, but a positive good. Yeah. Um, I, I think that, um, I think the author might have, um, I think he might have done a better job if he found somebody else. 
Neither Kendall, nor Calhoun, nor for that matter, Burke, believed in what Irving Crystal and Paul Weaver have called simple-minded arithmetical majoritarianism, government by adding machine. How, Kendall once asked, could the Founding Fathers have erected barriers to a plebiscitary system when no such system had been conceived until after their deaths? No American democracy takes that form, he argued, not by instant majority rule, but after an involved process of deliberation among virtuous men representing potentially conflicting and, in any case, different values and interests. Conservatives, that is, believe in consensus, not arithmetic. The Assault on Form The impatient new rightists, in their enthusiasm for methods of direct democracy, risk the unleashing of passions in their disdain for what Tocqueville called necessary form. Writing in Democracy in America, Tocqueville observed, Men living in democratic ages do not readily comprehend the utility of forms. Forms excite their contempt and often their hatred, as they commonly aspire to none but easy and present gratifications. They rush onward to the object of their desires, and the slightest delay exasperates them. The same temper, carried with them into political life, renders them hostile to forms, which perpetually retard or arrest them in some of their projects. Yet this objection which the men of democracies make to forms is the very thing which renders forms so useful to freedom. The new right's preference for direct voter participation in matters until recently left by and large to the legislative branches reflects a decline in the credibility of legislative bodies as well. According to Lewis L. Friedland, professor of political science at Wayne State University in Detroit, attempting to limit the judicial and legislative functions, the new right leaves only the executive branch and the people. No checks, no balances, the exact contrary of the 18th century conservatives who worked out the Constitution. Believing themselves to be shut out of the role they should play in determining the direction of their government, yet committed to the notion that there exists in this country a large majority of Americans who share their views, these right-wing populists have become fascinated by public opinion polls, which, they believe, should play an ever-growing role in determining positions taken by elected officials. They hail Proposition 13 and similar efforts to denounce the deliberative elites that have traditionally acted as buffers against untrammeled public will. The growing support among new rightists for abolishing the Electoral College is part of this trend. Utah Senator E.J. Jake Garn, a darling of the new right, has supported Senator Birch Bay's bill to abolish the Electoral College, which was defeated in the Senate in 1979. Kevin Phillips has been the most vocal proponent of the direct popular election, which traditional conservatives and some Democrats have warned against. Phillips believes that the Electoral College discriminates against third-party efforts, which it surely does, by institutionalizing the two major parties, between which Phillips sees, in George Wallace's quaint phrase, Not a dime's worth a difference. Getting rid of the Electoral College, Phillips has written, would open up U.S. presidential politics to a broad majoritarianism appeal that would not have to worry about possibly losing California or New York by a few thousand pivotal votes. That support system could be made up in Kansas or North Carolina. A preferable system, he argues, would be to allow this one-man, one-vote arrangement endorsed by American liberals. A reductionism traditional conservatives have argued could, if applied nationally, wreck radical changes in the American political system. Bickle wrote, The monopoly of power enjoyed by the two major parties would not likely survive the demise of the Electoral College. Now the dominance of two major parties enables us to achieve a politics of coalition and accommodation rather than of ideological and charismatic fragmentation, governments that are moderate in a regime that is stable, discouraging individual forays, and hence the sharply defined ideological or emotional stance. It makes, indeed, for a climate inhospitable to demagogues and provided by its very continuous existence a measure of guidance to the marginally interested voter who is eminently capable of casting his ballot by more irrelevant criteria. What is the danger of allowing California, for example, to carry the electoral clout it now enjoys? 
The state is home of an increasing number of minority groups, Phillips writes, and therefore, like New York, is becoming a third world state. Conservatives working to keep the Electoral College are maximizing the future presidential selection influence of a potential third world state, like California and New York is not far behind. Retention of the Electoral College would probably guarantee a minority-oriented presidential selection process for the 1980s. Martin Diamond of Georgetown University wrote that the real issue at stake in the debate over direct popular election of the president is nothing short of the very nature of American democracy. A conservative of the traditional school, Diamond argued that the debate is not democratic reform versus the retention of an undemocratic system, but rather a matter of which kind of democratic reasoning is to prevail in presidential elections. The traditional American idea that channels and constrains democracy on a rival idea that wishes democracy to be its entirely untrammeled and undifferentiated national self. It was precisely the impatient attitude towards such intermediary institutions as the courts or bureaucracy, Bickle has noted, that gave rise to the abuses of power under the Nixon administration, a trend he detected, interestingly enough, in the Warren Court. That liberal, more activist court cut through legal technicalities to get at the substance of things, and it was utterly inevitable that such a populist fixation should tend toward the concentration of power in the single institution which has the most immediate link to the largest constituency. The Presidency Expanding the powers of the Presidency has long been an objective of those, from Andrew Jackson to Franklin Roosevelt, who presumed to speak for the masses. At the very time when, in the wake of Vietnam and Watergate, liberals have come to be apprehensive about the dangers of the imperial presidency, the new right has begun to espouse it after years of rejection of the Hamiltonian tradition by the conservatives. Conservative intellectuals have shuddered at the prospect of an energetic president using the powers at his command to advance even conservative principles, rejecting Nelson Rockefeller in part as potentially aggressive, they eventually turned on the relatively conservative Richard Nixon for many of the same reasons. Yet new white publicists now stress the importance of capturing the White House, the only institution left that seems to them capable of doing ideological battle with the courts, the Congress, the federal bureaucracy, organized labor, and the news media. Pat Buchanan, for example, even rejects the notion of an imperial presidency. Watergate, he told me, was... Not at all a product of the imperial presidency. And the liberals who are talking that up are doing so for purely political reasons. They realize that they have an entrenched liberal congress and will have it for a long time. They realize too that the mood of the nation is such to elect a conservative president. For those reasons they want to strip the presidency of its powers. I'm not a traditional conservative in this regard. I think that a strong presidency is the only podium from which to put a conservative agenda before the nation. Illinois Republican Philip Crane agrees. He has been candid in his approval of the White House as a bully pulpit, in the words of Teddy Roosevelt. Another major political candidate, Ronald Reagan, notorious in conservative circles for his lack of interest in the day-to-day -day details of administration, also favors the bully pulpit approach. He is above all an orator and a right-wing evangelist. Like Reagan, John Connolly is an accomplished public speaker who owes his popularity more to his ability to arouse his audiences than to administrative competence. William Rusher's approval of John Connolly, no doctrinaire conservative, is rooted in his conviction that Connolly would be an energetic, expansive president. He would be an activist president, which I don't like as a general principle, Rusher told me. But it might be good now, just what we need to restore our worldly prestige. A powerful presidency is an inevitable consequence of the populist impulse. As James Burnham warned American conservatives, Caesarism is not the contradiction of democracy, but its fulfillment, he wrote. If democracy is understood in terms of a monolithic doctrine of the general will, 
Once the passion to eliminate the intermediary institutions or merely to bypass them is unleashed, elections are transferred into plebiscites, the function of which is to acclaim Kaiser, as Disraeli said in his acceptance speech after re-election to Parliament in 1848. I hope ever to be found on the side of the people and of the institutions of England. It is our institutions that have made us free and can alone keep us so. By the bulwark which they offer to the insidious encroachments of a convenient yet enervating system of centralization which, if left unchecked, will prove fatal to the national character. The implications of this tradition on the right, from Republicans to Democrats, or Democratists, are immense. What is at stake is nothing short of what kind of democracy is to prevail in America. The constitutional democracy as envisioned by the Founding Fathers, and here there was little disagreement between Hamilton and Jefferson, Adams at Madison, is at issue. As conceived by the founders, democracy was limited, restrained by a complex system of safeguards and restrictions. The work of government would be carried forth regularly, routinely, and calmly by constitutionally designated agencies, each as important as the next, each restrained yet accountable to the citizens. The Congress would be a deliberative body, a representative assembly, and, on few occasions, indeed, where the people, in the sense of a mass, to become directly involved in the governing process. These included regular election of representatives and constitutional conventions. But even in the latter, the people would work their will through designated representatives. That said, the new right would do well to heed the counsel of Will Herberg, who more than 20 years ago in a superb commentary on the career of Senator Joseph McCarthy addressed precisely this question. The American concept of democracy, he wrote in The New Leader, has come under increasing assault from the burgeoning forces of mass democracy. We have always endured demagogues impatient with constitutional processes and hot for direct action, but today because of the phenomenal development of the media and mass communication, these demagogues represent a real danger to the American political process. This, Herberg wrote, is the real threat of McCarthyism, government by rabble-rousing, which Herberg thought had been modernized by FDR and Senator McCarthy. When Roosevelt wanted to get some legislation put through, he virtually bypassed Congress and appealed directly to the people. The people, roused, responded immediately and deluged Congress with hundreds of thousands of letters and telegrams demanding action, and Congress proceeded to pass FDR's must legislation literally almost as fast as the bills could be read. What did that mean if not that Congress had ceased to be a deliberative body and that the de legislative process had virtually been taken over by so-called direct democracy? The new right has unhesitatingly adopted these tactics through the use of direct mail solicitation as well as television. Its greatest victories, its apologists say, are the mobilization of millions of Americans in opposition to the Panama Canal treaties, during which controversy they sent millions of angry letters, postcards, and telegrams to Capitol Hill, vowing revenge on senators who dared oppose them. Senator James McClure, an Idaho Republican, called for a national referendum on the future of the Panama Canal, Phillips noted in his column. If the president wants a given action from the Congress, he need only put his vast propaganda machine into action to deluge congressional offices with telegrams, telephone calls, letters, and increasingly personal visits from boisterous constituents. As political technology advances, the possibilities of such action become wider especially given the effectiveness with which FDR used radio more than 40 years ago and more recent presidents have used television. The presidency is viewed by the new rightists as a position from which opinions are broadcast, deriving its force less from party or executive responsibility than from the broad moral authority the office commands as the only truly national and plebiscitary spokesman. This, combined with the new right's impatience with deliberative institutions, 
sets up a potentially frightening model in which can be discerned roots of Burnham's expansive chief executive whose power is limited only by the general will which he can manipulate and exploit through the increasingly powerful means at his disposal. Congressman Paul Simon, the highly respected Illinois Democrat, believes that the new right represents a small percentage of the electorate, but already exercises a disproportionately high degree of political power as a result of skillful manipulation of popular resentments. When a candidate is on the campaign trail, Simon told me, he is forced to appeal to a broad mass of voters, to the mainstream of the American electorate, but in Washington, to a great extent, he becomes responsive to mail, which becomes his barometer of public sentiment in his district or state. The high-powered direct mail campaigns of the new right can distort his perception of public sentiment by inundating his office with postcards and the like, which suggest stronger feeling on an issue than really exists among the broad spectrum of his constituents. Simon believes that this is only part of a much larger and equally distressing trend. He observes that an increasing number of congressmen, state legislators, governors, and White House aides are taking polls to, to determine their positions on important questions instead of asking what is the national need. The new right may be only part of this development, but its uniquely forceful efforts in this direction can have an undue influence on people who only respond to the public opinion polls. They may follow the new right's lead because, having put their finger to the wind, they believe it to be blowing in that direction. The new right is powerful, out of all proportion to the size of their constituency, he concludes because it successfully manipulates public opinion, making it appear that the public opinion is more reactionary than indeed it is. Yet public opinion, as traditionally understood by conservatives, is not to be measured by opinion surveys or push-button responses. The people, as Bickle once put it, are something else than a majority registered on election day. Henry Farlyle has written that polls are not an index of public opinion, properly speaking at all. Public opinion, as understood since the days of the Greek city-states, is not the uninhibited voice of the public, if by that one means a mass of undifferentiated individuals. The public, instead, is created and given voice when it has been filtered through a political process, which resolves contradictions that appear when individuals offer, as in public opinion polls, instant opinions. Someone may believe or want A, but also believe or want B. If he finds that A or B are in conflict, he will have to abandon or at least modify one of them. This adjustment of interests and opinions in the individual voter is what takes place when he or she goes to the ballot box to choose between candidates, just as the adjustment of more general interests and opinions takes place in the traffic and wheeling and dealing of Congress. The checks and balances of the American system are intended to preserve the process of translating the popular will into public opinion and public policy. Representative bodies dealing with issues by protracted negotiation filter the popular voice. Which ensures that moral issues are not frivolously decided, especially by the whim of some majority of the moment. If one tried to govern a country by the decisions in referenda, that country would be in a ceaseless state of moral strife and indignation. A country in which highly sensitive questions are settled by continual referenda would be one of constant moral contention. The new rightists seem to prefer the fantasies and demagogues, the Anita Bryants, Howard Jarvis's, and John Briggs's, to the reasoned, responsible leadership associated with classic conservatism. Already such sensitive personal questions as abortion and homosexual rights are put to the public for its approval. We are entering a period when biological discoveries will force many difficult and vital decisions of public policy to be made by the society and the state. When the kind of fury that is aroused by busing or homosexuality, or 60 years ago by prohibition, is let loose on issues of life and death, we will have reason to quail, 
The thought of unfiltered popular voice playing around with genetics is terrifying. Then indeed we will be able to say that the Vox Populi has become the Vox Dei. The voice of the people has become the voice of God. Nothing less is at stake as the American right moves from a traditional conservative defense of representative government against the onslaughts of direct democracy into a celebration of government by rabble-rousing, by adding machine, by majorities of the moment.